Their words resonate across stages around the country, challenging actors and transporting audiences to places they've never been before. Hello, I'm Ted Chapin, Chairman of the American Theatre Wing, and today we're talking with four of the theatre's most thought-provoking voices. Playwrights Charles dream, Bush, next, uh, David Ives, Donald Margulies, and Susan Williams. Laurie Parks. Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Um, I wanted to, to, to start with a little bit of a, of a shameless plug for the American Theatre Wing's book, The Play That Changed My Life, only because um, I, saw, I, I read it in preparation for this, and Susan Laurie, you, you made a comment that I thought would be a great place to start. It was about, I'm, here, I'm paraphrasing here, and I'm in front of writers, so, um, that you had run into a young writer who had said, if it hadn't been for you, oh, yeah. I wouldn't have been a writer. And you then basically say, an oak is an oak is an oak, a writer is a writer is a writer. Right. So I wanted you to, to right. explain a little bit about oh, that. Oh, no. Well, I, I wanted the, the student, I think it was a student, uh, I, they accosted me on the street one day, and I, I wanted them to feel their own power, which is why I, I, I said that to them, like, no, you'd be a writer, you know, regardless of whether you'd met me or not, or whether you'd ever read any of my work or not. But I, I do think that um, uh, your oak, your oak will out, you know, your redwood will out. If you're a redwood, you're going to be a redwood. And you might just end up, who knows what you'll end up writing, but I believe that, you know, like some people dance, some people mm -hmm. sing, some people sing and dance, and some people sing, dance, and write. And but, but since everybody has to write in school, I mean, writing is something everybody has to do, but I, I'm, I'm right. fascinated by when I know that not yeah. only you had said that at one point you knew you were going to write, but you didn't know what. Ah. Well, I, you know, I, I wanted to be a playwright for some bizarre reason, and I don't know why. But uh, I started out my life as a visual artist, and for me, writing was always nice. sort of a deep, dark secret, uh, because I, I felt that I would be uh, dilettante if I attempted to do too many things. But when I did, uh, when I went to art school and decided that I was going to try writing plays, I introduced myself to Julius Novick, who was teaching dramatic literature at Purchase, SUNY Purchase. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I said, I'm a visual arts major. He said, have you ever written a play before? I said, no. He said, I'd love to sponsor you in a tutorial. And that was really the seminal moment of my development as a writer, because it was as if I'd been given permission to write. Mm -hmm. And I decided that I was going to do that. It's th it's very strange that I decided that 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 I might succeed as a as a writer when I, I felt that I wasn't going to succeed as a as a visual artist. I just I just wasn't I wasn't a unique enough visual and artist. And how old were you in this? Twenty happened? years old. That early, you yeah. you yeah took the path. Huh. I was twenty, and uh, and you know it's not as if I became a playwright instantly, but at least I set my sights on something that I had never really seriously considered before. And, uh, and it was thrilling. It was thrilling. And Charles, you said you, you were a writer yeah. to give yourself some material. Well, yeah, I, I always was writing. I, I, all my life, I, I was. And I, and I was writing plays even as a kid. Mm -hmm. But I didn't think that I would be a writer. I, I just could, I was, I grew up in New York. And, and I was taken to the theater. Mm -hmm from an early age, so I, I always wrote. But to me, the, my obsession was to be on stage. And, and I think it was um, maybe, I don't you know, you know, we simplify things so much in our memory, but you know, perhaps when I saw Charles Ludlam mm -hmm. uh, and, and realized that uh, a theatrical experience didn't have to be just the, the Broadway uh, Mm -hmm. Comedies and musicals that I was raised on that it could, you know it really could be I could create whatever world I wanted to and and roles for myself and so so I really did write for a long time just to um, to give myself opportunities to act and then. did you as a as a kid did you put on your own shows um, well, yes I did but really it was starting in college and then and then when I graduated immediately I just mm -hmm. began. <coughs> writing plays, and I, I, I've never been particularly um, snobby about where I put them on. You know? In fact, <laughs> I, I guess I, I just lo I've always so loved sort of the raffish end of, uh, of showbiz <laughs> that, that you, know, when, you know, sometimes you run into someone on the street who, who 
I don't know if this happens to you, who's doing something that they think is a little bit tacky, and you know, tries <laughs> they try to make it out to sound better. You know, oh, I'm, yeah. well, I'm, I'm playing um, uh, Henry Higgins uh, <laughs> in My Fair Lady, uh, and the more, more you in kind bowling of, well, it turns out. Yeah. But I think it's great. I, you know, I wish they'd told me the truth. I, uh, really, it's a dinner theater, and, and where, you know, <laughs> in, in, in Hocus, really. I mean, to me, it all sounds yeah. marvelous. So, you know, I was never snobbed that way. <laughs> No, it's, you know, sometimes I, I always, I was listening to what you're saying, and sometimes I, I think we, we write to create roles for ourselves, whether or not we're actors. Oh, really? I, I do. I, I just find that the, when, a, when, in my experience, when a, a usually a, a kid who has never seen himself or herself on stage, and they, that's the first, when they come to the theater and for the first time they say, that's me, you know, mm -hmm. um, or that's like me, that's someone like me, and, um, you know, we, we some I feel like we write to give ourselves, in the biggest sense of the word, a place to be. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and there we are on stage. Um, I don't know. I just happened to think of that. Uh, you did, that you, did you ever uh, want, actually yeah. want to be an actress? No, <laughs> but I have. <laughs> no, but I have. Uh, I've done acting. You know, I've act. You know, I think actors are amazing and incredibly talented. And you know, I've done some acting, but I never. And uh, and have you written no. roles and and plays of yours that that you. I don't know. Sort of felt you could do in a certain sense if you chose to, if you oh, wanted not, to. Oh, not no, not as an act, not as an actress, but me, meaning myself, meaning my s capital S self, uh, like okay. my universal self. Right. You know. <laughs> no, I think I think w one of the great things about being a playwright is you get to hang out with actors who are yeah. infinitely right. more interesting and right. nice than we are. You know, <laughs> and oh, and know. so <laughs> well, maybe not nice. <laughs> right. No, right. but um, you know, I think I was. I may have been. Ruined for life by playing the big bad wolf opposite Amy Skian in the third <laughs> grade at St. Mary Magdalene School, and I, I suspect that that was th that that was it, and that I uh, when I wrote my first play at nine, I was actually trying to get back to Amy Skian, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and and give her a, go a better part than she'd had in that play we had to rehearse. Mm. But you know, we toured to the fourth grade, which was amazing. <laughs> you know, we were such a hit in the third grade wow. that the nuns took us to the fourth grade, and so. Wow. You know, that's the kind of thing that can just absolutely undo you for life. That's right. And um, so that plus seeing a delicate balance when I was 17 did it. I think mm -hmm. those two things together, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I wrote my first play when I was nine. And so I, I, I feel like I always mm -hmm. knew. I, I just, I don't know what it was. I think coming from closed mouthed blue collar, Polish Catholic South Chicago where mm -hmm. Yeah. House tricks was a whole conversation, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and so to see something like a delicate balance when I was seventeen did that did mm -hmm. that unlocking because I had never seen people so brutally honest mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. eloquent uh -huh. and and so so going to the core of something that was utterly important and right. I, and I remember right. that. That experience was like sitting in the in the in the front car of the cyclone at Coney Island and just being <laughs> absolutely great. dizzy with uh -huh. with the power of that of that show. And so, um, I I have to say though I think you're right. It's there is yeah. you're you're trying to you're creating that little world of of all your uh, for yourself mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. you, you had mentioned Julius Novick. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> Are there other people who, who had perhaps a seminal, at a seminal moment in your lives, sort of focused you or gave you the encouragement that made you feel, yes, mm -hmm. you know, I can actually do this? Because you are, I point out that you are all working successful American playwrights at, at what some people consider an endangered species, but here are four right. fine, fine members of that. But a, a seminal well, moment. Well, you know, like David, I, I was inspired watching theater. Uh, and Herb Gardner's A Thousand Clowns was the first straight play I ever saw, one that wasn't a musical. Mm -hmm. And uh, so before, 20 plus years before I met Herb, he was a mentor uh, because he had inspired me so by, by the uh, exhilaration I felt seeing A Thousand Clowns when mm -hmm. I was nine. I remember seeing it at the court theater and I can, uh, I can visualize where I was seated when I leaned forward and saw bubbles, that little doll light it, whose breasts lit up. And I remember that <laughs> being a very profound moment for me in, in my birth as a playwright. And uh, so that, you know, so it's those kinds of influences that, that contribute to a sense of ambition and purpose. And so Herb was certainly one, one of those forces. And then... Uh, and the doll. 
Yeah. <laughs> the dog's <the> quest. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess uh, I think well, that for can't me, be it's, it's actually more of a, as an actor in a certain sense that I, uh, when I was a kid, I saw uh, Zoe Caldwell do the prime of Miss Jean Brody, and, mm -hmm. and it was just wow. the most extraordinary performance. Wow. And, and you know, yeah. she it was it was so bigger than life, and yet mm -hmm. honest. And and I. Uh, I guess, I don't know, maybe I was 13 or something like that, and, and things were so much easier as far as security goes, so I, I just ended up backstage afterwards, found oh. her dressing room after the matinee, yeah. uh, and, and wow. she was so kind to me, and I, it seemed like I was in there in my memory an awful long time, and, you know, and, and she, you know, I, I want to be an actor, and, and she said, you're the face of an actor. Of course, that means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and so then I, I tried to make this very edit the story very down. But then it was my dream for the next uh, 25 years that someday she would see me perform and think I was mm. talented. And she mm. came to see me in this play called Red Scare on Sunset. And she mm -hmm. and I didn't know she was there. And it was this awful night, just the deadest audience. Mm -hmm. And and you know I was quite young. And so in those days I. If you had a dead audience, you know, I just worked harder to somehow <laughs> <laughs> twist them into coming around. And she came backstage and, and she said, uh, uh, she said, you're so beautiful, but you're pushing too hard. <laughs> <laughs> she gave this whole lecture and did a rather cruel imitation. <laughs> Actually, I don't know. But she was so, so, so right. And I, I really, you know, I thought, well, you know, I, I listened. And then yeah. her breasts lit up and <laughs> everything was fine. I, I, I listened to Zoe Caldwell and made a big, big impression on me. But are, are there yeah. actors that, that you have written specific parts for who become part of your sort of repertory company? So is Laurie, are there? <laughs> um, no, I, I have yet to do that, but there are actors I love, of course, mm -hmm. and I, I, um, I l enjoy when they, you know, sign on and say yes yeah. and things like that, and hope to work with them again and again. But I haven't I, written. I, have I, you? I, I have to say that I could, uh, yeah, I got sort of a, a name writing these short comedies back mm -hmm. in, you know, back in, in the '90s when the punch Manhattan Punchline was going, and I have to say that I couldn't have written many of those plays if I hadn't had a place to do it, even though mm -hmm. the Manhattan Punchline was basically a, a Xerox machine and mm -hmm. a bankrupt artistic director, mm -hmm. and a group of actors who sort of just, who who found their way to my plays and knew how to do them. And, mm -hmm. a, and so once I had that little group of Nancy mm -hmm. Opel and yeah. Robert Stanton and Annie, O'Sull Annie O'Sullivan and, and Denton Stone and Arnie Burton, I could just, I could write whatever I wanted because I knew there mm -hmm. were people who, would, who could execute it in the same mm -hmm. way that, mm -hmm. you know, you write for singers if you know they can hit the notes. And so that was an incredibly yeah. freeing thing to have. And when the punchline closed and there were no more one-act festivals to be had around town, then I have to say I sort of slowed down writing those plays just because there was no venue. And, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it was incredibly valuable. I learned so many things through them working on these things and seeing what the possibilities of theater are just in one mm -hmm. actor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very liberating. I, I love writing for specific people. Of course, I've ri written for myself for so, so long. Um, but also, uh, I had a theater company in the uh, 80s and early 90s. and, and uh, there were these eight people, and we, I just wrote all these plays mm -hmm. for them, and it, and it was fascinating. It was almost like uh, like I was at the MGM factory, <laughs> a dream factory, and, uh, and, yeah. and, and it was interesting because each one of them had what we called their trip, you know, a, a, their sort of comic trip, a, and, and the challenge was to, in each play, give them the opportunity to do their trip, but then to extend it a bit, and, and mm -hmm. they were, in, you know, and, and the group was in varying degrees of, um, professionalism too and 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 so it was it was fascinating I I, I find it actually in in having the, I don't want to call it a limitation but having sort of these fixed things that you have to to do mm -hmm. in a way frees me frees my imagination they're sort of givens mm -hmm. a little structure within yeah, which yeah, you, can, I, you I, can I love it I'm uh, yeah. or and, and then uh, well with the tale of the Aldrich's wife I I had just begun writing the play and then I saw Linda Lavin do a show called Death Defying Acts. And I thought, oh my God, she should j it would just be ideal for her to play the main character. And, uh, and then from then on, I just heard her voice in it. And then I was lucky enough to, to get her. And I, you've got her. <laughs> <laughs> but also, we were talking earlier about Laura Linney, who's, who's mm -hmm. sort of had a wonderful, sort of circuitous route through a lot of your plays. Well, well Laura and I, I think we're, we're bonded for life because we, we both had breakthroughs in my play, Sight Unseen. 
1992. She was pretty fresh out of Juilliard when she did it. And it was, you know, it was one of those, those legendary auditions, which you had described to me about your experience recently, of, of uh, this young, beautiful woman walking in. I'd never seen her before, and she auditioned. And we had seen a succession of ingenues at that point, dozens and dozens of ingenues, to play the German interviewer in mm -hmm. Sight Unseen, mm -hmm. who was only in two scenes, but they were juicy scenes. And Laura came in, and she had all of the right qualities. And it was one of those, one of those movie moments where suddenly this person walks into the room, and you're leaning forward and listening to the scene as if you hadn't written it, and you just you fall in love. So we did have that moment together of, uh, of having a, our first hit together, essentially. And then years later, when she became a leading lady, she ascended to the, to the female lead in the revival of Sight Unseen. And then when I was working on Time Stand Still, I can't say that I wrote it for her, certainly not consciously. But as it evolved, I thought, wow, Laura would be really good at this. <laughs> and, you know, so it was pure luck that I was able to get her when I did. And uh, because so often you do write abstractly for somebody in mind. They're never available. They're doing a pilot or something, you know. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it's very frustrating because then you're kind of locked into the voice that you've heard all in, during the creation of it. But I've been very fortunate to have Laura available to do this, mm -hmm. this part that she's so beautifully she's well suited for. David, you had a recent experience of an audition in Venus and Fur, I think, worth yeah. telling. Venus yeah. and Fur. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, is about um, it, it's a playwright sitting in an audition room, waiting, uh, trying to, desperately to find the right actress for this play, and he's been through dozens and dozens and dozens. And um, lo and behold, an, an actress walks in who is absolutely the wrong person for the play. Mm -hmm. he, she, she has to play this cultured, cultivated, poised 19th century woman, and mm -hmm. and in walks this girl in S and M bondage gear, yeah. who's cl <laughs> clearly sort of East Village material, and she um, she absolutely destroys his day, and then she begins to mm -hmm. speak, and, and instantly she becomes, that, she becomes that woman, and there's this extraordinary, mo supposed to be this moment <laughs> of transformation. <laughs> <laughs> how I hoped, how I prayed. <laughs> there would be this moment of transformation, and she, becomes, she is that person, and she absolutely knocks him out, and then the two of them go between the audition room and the play and erase the usual Pirandellian lines between illusion and reality illusion and reality. And um, so oddly enough, we couldn't find an actress for this part. And we went through we went through some stars who wanted to play the part, whom we did not want to play the part. And because they simply couldn't, they couldn't do both sides of that character. Mm -hmm. And then one day we had uh, a sort of open call audition. And this young woman named Nina Arianda walked in. And we rolled our eyes because she was clearly absolutely the wrong person for this part. <laughs> the artistic director of Classic Stage tells me that he made a mental note to give the, the casting director hell for sending <laughs> in this girl who was clearly so wrong, straight out of NYU. You know, nothing on her resume except mm -hmm. special skills, you know, that kind of, <laughs> that kind of resume. And so, we, she's, and so she walked in and throws a bag down and she's flopping all over the place. And she said, what do you want? And we said, well, why don't you do the first scene in that kind of hopeless, mm -hmm. will you please leave the <laughs> room voice? And she opened her mouth and she was it. Mm -hmm. And it was this extraordinary confluence mm -hmm. of play yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. and actress. Yeah. And n that's not the only spooky thing, is that it struck me at some point that we had Nina Arianda, mm -hmm. who plays a character named Vonda, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Nina rhymes with Venus. And so it, it was a little spooky. Mm -hmm. And she simply mm -hmm. inhabited that part from the moment she opened wow. her. And we, wow. you know, she left the room and we said, call her agent, we have to get her right mm -hmm. now. It was just like that. It was like an Irving Berlin musical, <laughs> but about an S&M play. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. You right, did, because right. sometimes then the, the callback is, yeah. is disastrous. It's a disaster. Yes. We, no, right. we, yeah. no we, we knew it, we knew it. Because we, Walter Bobby gave her direction because he, you know, you get that fear that what you're seeing is what you're gonna get and so, mm -hmm. He pulled her aside and he gave her this very complicated direction where he said, you're playing it too hard, you have to let him come to you, you are not seducing him. You mm -hmm. are, and that's a, that's a tough bit of direction because you have, to, you have to play an objective but not seem to. And she said, okay, and she did it and it was electrifying. Mm -hmm. And so there wow. she is playing it and wow. just got a part in the new Woody Allen movie. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's like that odd story. Uh, it's Shirley MacLaine in Pajama yes. Game. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. and, uh -huh. And she is brilliant. She, uh, you know, she's like young Meryl Streep. She can do everything, 
and mm -hmm. so we were we were just blessed. We were That's just great. blessed that day. <laughs> that day. <laughs> so sometimes uh, these auditions, when you sit there though, and and hear the same scene read, mm -hmm. you know, forty times, and and it's just oh, the scene is, it, it, and you're he hearing the same scene read so badly That's or right. and wrongly, mm -hmm. over and over and over, and you think. This is a horrible scene. <laughs> this is just terrible. And I actually, I, although sometimes it's helpful, I then go back and I, I edit the, I edit it down mm -hmm. and re rewrite it after just hearing it so badly done. You, at a certain point, you can't blame them all. Right. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, I guess it, I guess it, it's just overwritten. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What about directors? You were, you were talking about your your collaboration with Walter Bobby. That, that it's been good. Are there uh, are there directors that you guys have uh, and Gal have worked with and like and tend to go back to and, and are part of your sort of collaborative world. Well, Walter is, Walter's become sort of the brother I never had in, in the world and, and an ideal collaborator. He counted up recently that we've done 15 things together of one kind or another from wow. Venus and Fur to White Christmas to him being in a play of mine to him being <laughs> my boss at, at Encores when he was artistic director there, which is how we met. And so we talk, we talk every day and we just, he, as an actor, he knows things that, that, he knows how to speak to actors that in a way that I don't know and knows how to talk to me about actors. Mm -hmm. he, um, he's a consummate performer, a great comic, and so I'm very blessed. He's the opposite of the, the director who directed All in the Timing, who was, who was of this sort of military school. And when mm -hmm. I first met, I was introduced to him because somebody said he knows how to, he knows how to, how to direct this play, which was a sure thing. And I met him and he shook my hand and th there was none of the usual, I love your play, I love your work, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm such a big fan, I love your language mm -hmm. and your humor. You know, that conversation, <laughs> there was none of that. He said, how do you do, I've read your play, I like it quite a lot, but you go wrong on page 12, let me show you why. And he opened it up and he, and he pointed to the line where he went wrong and I thought, good, I like it. And so we did it and it was great. Um, I love George Sewell. I do. You have good reason to. Yes. I have good reason to, yeah. Um, when he and I did Top Dog Underdog, that was really the, it was, it was, I mean, it was like hand in glove or all those things. We, we to my memory, we never, without, the kind of work I love to do with the directors, we never really talked about the meaning of the play, you know, the, or the, the significance or the, you know, the meta, whatever, all these scholars are talking about meta, meta, meta. I don't really know what it means, but it's a word. Um, he, we just, you know, he just worked with the actors most and Jeffrey or Don Cheadle and Jeffrey and, and we just, we just went forward working on it. It was beautiful, it was absolutely beautiful, mm -hmm. um, so. W were there changes during the rehearsal process? Uh, or, oh, or, oh or sure, or there was that moment, I mean, I, I've told the story so many times, but there was that moment when George said, we were in the, at the public in downtown still with Don and Jeffrey, uh, Je Don Cheadle and Jeffrey Wright, and there was that moment when, when George said, I want to know more about Lincoln's job. And I say that because he talks about right. it. I want to know more about I said, um, I said, what do you want to know? And he said, well, I don't know what I want to know. I just want to know more. <laughs> and I said, um, I said, how much? Like that. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave me this look. And, and I said, well, tell me how much. You know, just tell me how much. And he said, go, go home and write. <laughs> so I was living in Brooklyn then. And, um, and, you know, Publix on Lafayette. And I went up three rows up to where the stage manager uh, Rick Steiger was sitting and I said dude let me borrow your computer and I just watching them I was just typing and George looks up and he says what are you doing and I said I'm writing I'm writing you the same <laughs> we pushed print and I just walked down and I handed it to him and it was my favorite it's my, still my favorite part in the play where Lincoln talks about his job and he's huh? looking in um, looking in his at his reflection and it's it's my favorite part of the play so those kinds of changes you know mm. but it was really I felt that sort of just we were that comfortable it's together. The way it's supposed to work. Yeah. Well, well, who knows supposed to, but it did that time. So, yeah. yeah. I've been a, I've been a very very lucky playwright uh, to have Dan Sullivan in my life. Mm -hmm. um, we've done uh, not fifteen things together, but um, I guess we've done about six productions and a couple of workshops of the same plays. Um, wow. But. This this most recent experience of, of Time Stand Still uh, was ha, was a joy from day one, really, and whenever and it reminded me of how I cherish my collaboration with Dan, of, mm -hmm. of being in the room, being in a rehearsal room that is run by Dan Sullivan, mm -hmm. is really an extraordinary experience, and I can't even I can't even describe what it is, but there is 
a sense of calm and fun mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. comfort. And uh, see, the wonderful thing for me in, in, in having Dan is that I utterly trust him. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. utterly do. I never question it. Or when I do question it, I usually come around to his point of view. Uh, you know, and he, you know, some people say, do you have these you know, in-depth dramaturgical? We mm -hmm. don't really right. have those right. conversations. Right. We, do, we don't. We huh. respond to the moment-to-moment -moment mm -hmm. stuff, and you know, he'll say, you know, uh, you got to help me here. You know? mm -hmm. But you know, he, he, he would have tried it. He would have tried to make it work six different ways, mm -hmm. and he wasn't succeeding. And it would be okay, you you fix mm -hmm. it, <laughs> right. you know. Mm -hmm. But at least I would trust that he made every effort to make it comprehensible. Mm -hmm. And if he wasn't able to do that, mm -hmm. then it was it was my fault, mm -hmm. and uh, not fault, but responsibility certainly. Mm -hmm. But but in this most recent experience, um, there were a f there were moments, you know, we'd be sitting in our our music stands and. And I would just feel moved at this great experience, you know, just mm -hmm. cherishing a sense of um, value and import that we were really doing something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I always feel that I'm learning from him. It's always like a master class with Dan. You know, he chooses his words very carefully. He's very, very specific. He knows how to talk to directors in ways that I, I simply couldn't. I don't know. I don't have the vocabulary to do it. I would sabotage myself if I tried to speak to, to actors because I, I would express my impatience with what oh. they were doing. Mm -hmm. And I would just want results. And Dan knows exactly how to achieve something incrementally. You know, I, you know if, if, he, if I give him a note and then a day later I say, well, didn't you give him that? I'm working on it. I'm working mm -hmm. on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he will have been working on it. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a fascinating, fina fascinating ride, I, and we've been working together now for 11 years, and I hope mm -hmm. he's the reason I'm going to have to continue writing plays, <laughs> <laughs> uh, because it's, it's just too exhilarating, it's too much fun. Well, what about writing for yourself and handing it over to a director? I mean, what is, yeah. what is that? Uh, well, you know, I've really only worked with very few people, you know, I've only, in, I don't know how many years, uh, 25, 30 years, I've really, for the most part, only worked with three people. Hmm. Uh, and uh, first, uh, a fellow, Ken Kenneth Elliott, mm -hmm. who um, I really uh, kind of owe my career yeah, to, you fantastic. know, when we started doing plays in the East Village, and he not only, he was my roommate and at the time, and, and uh, you know, we were putting on these plays, and then it, it really, he decided that we should move it, Vampire Lesbians of Sodom, mm -hmm. to a commercial theater, and he, he moved it. I, I don't know where I'd be if, if he had <laughs> somehow figured out that we had to raise fifty-five thousand dollars and then somehow found it and and then did it and then that established me. Um, and so I did many plays with Ken and and uh, you know I that was just a wonderful collaboration and and I've enjoyed I've done several plays with Lynn Meadow mm -hmm. and uh, I that was I guess my big commercial break with her mm -hmm. and and then for the past. Uh, Decade or more, I've been working with a very talented uh, young director named Carl Andrus, mm -hmm. who is. Uh, we're just so so in sync, you know that that, uh, and he and and I, I feel such a freedom too. I, even though he's totally dominates the room, mm -hmm. you know he's the <laughs> boss, you know, and I, you know, and, you know, and, and it's, it's an odd thing because you know I'm also the star of the play mm -hmm. and and the author, mm -hmm. uh, but he's not afraid of letting me just. Talk to people, right. you know, yeah. and um, you know, so I, I can actually, you know, tell tell an actor, you know, how things are, and he's, he's not mm -hmm. threatened at all, and mm -hmm. it's, it's a wonderful collaboration. I think he's he's the real deal. Do, do you all believe if, if you if you trust the director, do you leave them alone in the beginning of rehearsal and get out of the room, or do you like to be in the room watching it evolve? Well, I, I don't know how, how my, my distinguished colleagues work, but <laughs> I, I like being there for the first few days. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's usually during that time that I'm honing the script and cutting and rearranging and, and uh, rethinking. But I like to do that in the first few days of rehearsal. I, I, I don't enjoy throwing new pages at my actors you know, in the fourth week. Um, it makes me very anxious to do that. But what I generally do is I go away after about four days. When the actors are ready to get up on their feet, I leave. Because that is, I see that as their attempt to do a first draft. Okay, I've done my draft, now you do your draft. 
So I would leave them alone, and then if it's Dan, that he would, you know, he would call me or email me and say, uh, I think you should come to a stumble through on Tuesday. And that's when I would come. Otherwise, you know, the days would go by and I wouldn't hear a word about how things were going. I would, if I heard nothing, I assumed things were going well or moving in the right direction. And, uh, and then when I see a stumble, stumble through, I have a draft mm -hmm. to respond to, the director's first cut, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then I do some more tinkering then and then go away again and then uh, spend a lot of time in previews, though. I don't know how you guys like to work, but. Yeah, I'm pretty much almost yeah. exactly the same. I yeah. think there's a certain mm -hmm. point maybe a week maybe that I, I think it's best to get out mm -hmm. if, I'm, if, if I'm not in the play. Right. <laughs> 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 you must it's a little hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually learned a, I learned a lesson early on when I was, I was in my 20s and I had a play being done at, at uh, a little theater and I, a director I didn't know and, and we worked on the play. This is what I called my Tennessee Pinter play. It was, you know, it was, it, was, um, it had all the flaws of both, but you know, none of the, the glories of either. And, um, and the, the director said to me, it was a family play, mother, son, uh, daughter, and dark, and all of that stuff. And, and he said to me one day, you know, I think you, if you could go away, just, you know, take a couple of days off. And I've got a couple of ideas. And I, and I thought, hey, great, that's a good idea. I'll, I'll go away. He's got ideas. And so, um, I went away and I came back to rehearsal and there was nobody there but the director and he said, come on in, come on in, we're all ready for you and mm -hmm. the stage was all set up and I said, where are the actors? He said, oh, they're getting ready, they're getting ready, they're getting ready. Sit down and so we sat down and um, the play begins and everything's exactly the same but then one scene ends and another scene begins and some music comes up and the young man enters with his mother and they dance together and he takes his clothes off <laughs> and then he, you know, they waltz around the room a bit and then he goes away and the music stops and the next scene begins as it, as it had been. Mm -hmm. And so I, of course, was just, I was livid, you know, <laughs> and, and he could feel it. You know, I must have, it must have been seismic, you know. And I'm only, I wasn't even smart enough to know why this was a bad idea. <laughs> and so it, it ends in, and, and the play ends and he goes, David, 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 I know you're upset. I know you're upset. <laughs> but listen, I have to tell you something. You don't understand your play. I understand your play. And I said, okay, you understand my play, but the Rodgers and Hammerstein dream ballet that you put into my play goes out today or this is not going up. And I'm amazed that I stood up for myself. And, but there was a second lesson right on top of that one, which was that the woman who played the mother, the P Tennessee Pinter mother, started to act the end of the play in this sort of very strange somnambulistic fashion. And nothing we did could convince her to do anything different. And so th the play went on as it did. It, it was a, we had four people in the audience every night. But I ran into the actress months later on the street and she said, I'm so glad to see you to talk about your play. Did you notice, did you notice what I did with the part? I said, oh, I, I certainly <laughs> did. <laughs> yes, I did, that was fascinating. And she said, David, can I tell you something? He didn't understand the play. I understood <laughs> the play. He didn't know that she is dead for the entire end of the play. And I said, I am so glad you noticed that. <laughs> so I learned so many lessons from that particular experience about directors and actors. Well, you know, I, I, I don't really go anymore, but you know, early on I would sometimes see productions of my plays in other cities, Ooh, you know, and, yes. and, and oh, you no. find grow, get out, you just take the check and no, don't go. But I, I remember one time uh, I saw a production of, of a play that of, of Psycho Beach Party, which was you know, a little romp that we did that was mm -hmm. 90 minutes, right. no intermission, and I saw this production that was a full hour longer. <laughs> you know, and I, 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 how the hell did they, you know? And 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 they well they put an intermission in, you know, for one thing and. Uh, and I remember that someone sent me a, a review that said, Clear, clearly Bush doesn't know how to end a first act. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, oh, just a wild goings on and dream ballets and, 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 and visual buttons and, and pauses and, and songs added. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's just amazing what, what, they, what, they, what they do. Sometimes it can be. I mean, I, totally, I, I agree with you. I don't see, you know, the longer plays I don't go out of town to see. But when we did 365 Days, 365 Plays, part of the fun of it was to go all over the world and see a production mm -hmm. of a play that I'd written by people I'd never met or, and often never heard of. And I just remember in one case, there were, it was a, a little family, mini family drama that I'd written and the folks who did it were all, 
a uh, head to toe sleeved, the whole bit tattooed and pierced, mm -hmm. and they did it nude. And part of it was to come up and lick the audience, and that was their. And it was fantastic. I thought, <laughs> okay, if you know, this here we are. We're here to like applaud you. So it was a real fun. And where just, is that playing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It was pretty intense. I mean, we just, I just stood there with that, all the, the other folks had come, and we just, I was like, this is cool. This is their take on it, you know? And it was cool. Like, yeah. it was cool. But that was part of the fun of that whole yeah. festival, yeah. just yeah. to see, like, throw the ball out right. and see what, right. see what they do with yeah. it. But, yeah. <laughs> it, it felt good, too, I got to say. What, what was the, the 365? play project that you talked about, because it's fascinating, I mean, oh, unique, I believe. Yeah, we, um, what I did is I wrote a play a day for a whole year, and then we did it all over, we had 700 theaters in the United States do it for a whole year, like we did a play a day mm -hmm. all over the country, and then we did it in places like Burma and Berlin and Kenya and South Africa and Moscow, we did a little bit, and all over. So we had all these theater artists doing this festival for a year, and we had a website, and you could post you could you know upload your little bit of the play and I mean your little presentation it was a lot of fun and you got to meet people who uh, theaters that I'd never mm -hmm. heard of I mean some of them like you know folks at the public theater would do some or whatever but or um, in LA or Seattle you know known folks but also there were people who were doing theater who would say, we're, I'd go to a place and they'd go, we're the Elm Street players. And I'd say, wow, like, mm -hmm. how long have you been a theater group? Oh, just this week we, we banded <laughs> together <laughs> to do your plays. <laughs> and it was cool. They were amazing. They were really that's amazing. That's and you really think, cool. you just sort of invite, you know, you send it out to the world and, and see what response you get. And it was lovely. Well, I'm going to steal licking the audience. Yeah. I'm going to steal that. That's going into the next play. They're not doing that. They're not doing that. They're not doing that. They're They lick, yeah. They lick and then you run. That's what you do. You do. It's good. It's good. I'm going to put it in. Well, I don't know why I'd make this connection, but 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 sort of theater homes. I mean, you you all you all have theaters that tend that there are homes for your place. How did how did that come about, and what did they what what do those places give you? Well. Uh, they took me in at a time when I needed to be taken in, and um, and the theaters that I that I think you're referring to in my case, uh, in in uh, Orange County, there's a theater called South Coast Repertory, mm -hmm. uh, uh, which really took me under their wing before anyone was producing me nationally. Uh, Jerry Patch, who is now at the Manhattan Theater Club as an artistic associate, um, was the literary manager at South Coast Repertory and read The Loman Family Picnic, I think, and decided that I was a writer that he should commission a play from. So he did. I think that was 22 years ago or something like that. And the, the commission uh, became sight unseen, and then they commissioned another play, and that was Collected Stories, and another play that became Brooklyn Boy, and another play that became Shipwrecked in Entertainment. So we had a, a very, very long, fruitful collaboration. Uh, so that's been my West Coast base. The Geffen Playhouse is sort of my summer home in Los Angeles, <laughs> but uh, but Manhattan Theater Club has really been my New York base since 1984. 1984, right. when I was in the writers' unit that the late Jonathan Alper was running at Manhattan Theater Club, and it was people like me and John Shanley and oh gosh, who else? John Guare was there, and Richard Greenberg was there. And you know we were all <laughs> together in these horrible rooms on 73rd Street, and um, and that relationship just grew and became a really loving, dependable home. Uh, and, you know, there's so much dysfunction in our business, mm -hmm. but the, the, uh, MTC for me has become a very um, uh, comfortable, functional home life. Um, so I, I'm, I'm very happy and proud to say that uh, Collected Stories and its recent incarnation will be my ninth wow. production at Manhattan Theatre Club. So it's, it's very special. I uh, worked for uh, quite a while with the WPA Theatre, mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that was marvelous that uh, Kyle Rennick was the um, artistic director and producing director, and, uh, uh, and it was just so easy, you know, they, I must say, uh, like I would, oh, just call him up and say, I'm, I'm looking on my calendar, and if I, if, if I don't do a play in March, you know, I don't think I'll be able to do one for a long time. And, and mm -hmm. so would you have anything in mind? Well, 
not really. I said, mm -hmm. I think I'd be an, I'm an actress that gets uh, popped over the head and imagine she's Lady Godiva. And, <laughs> and he said, okay. And, and, uh, and, and then you know, I just, re I said, when do we open? And he said, you know, it's March great. 19th. And so uh, and then I, had to, I had to write that play and it turned into something completely different. Right. So I did a number of those. And then um, Manhattan Theater Club, uh, I must say Lynn Meadow uh, did a rather amazing thing. Um, I first went there, I wrote the book to a, um, a musical that wasn't very well received at the time, and, and um, on the opening night when the reviews were disappointing, uh, Lynn said, um, well, I, I believe in you and I'll produce your next play, whatever it is. And so, so I mm -hmm. thought, hmm, uh, <laughs> that maybe I shouldn't you know, spring on her. Um, Vampire Lesbians of Sodom Part Two, <laughs> so I, I ended up doing The Allergist Wife, and mm -hmm. um, and then we, we've done another play after that. But yeah, she's she's extraordinarily loyal. Wow. And Susan Laurie, the public has been. The public is is my home. Yeah, I'm uh, their first master writer chair. But it's it started at a party. Uh, <laughs> years ago, I know uh, with alcohol, I'm sure, sure was involved. <laughs> but George C. Wolf was hanging out. Uh, we were at a party, and he said. He said, uh, you know, I'm going to get a theater and I'm going to do your plays. And, you know, we've all heard that, or, <laughs> may, or I've heard it a lot, enough for all of us. But, um, and when he uh, became the artistic director, or as he called him, the producer was his title, I think, at the Public Theater, he actually did my plays. And we started with the America play, and then we did Venus, and In the Blood, and Fucking A, and then Top Dog, Underdog, 365. They were the New York hub for 365. Mm -hmm. And then last year, yeah, Father Comes Home from the Wars, Part One, and then now the Book of Grace. So that's eight shows in since '94, I think, and they've been great. And now working with Oscar at the Public, it's it's more good stuff, you know. So. And you you have a, a, a you, you're the master. The master writer chair. I know. It's like. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. <laughs> what other responsibilities does that give uh, you? I'm supposed to uh, participate in the life of the theater. I have a position also at, at NYU as part of it. And I, I see my job as, uh, you know, spreading uh, love and goodwill throughout the building and into the street. <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of, I mean, that's what we do. You know, so when, and sometimes you sit in those meetings where they're talking about numbers, 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 and you're sitting there and you s might say something and they, after the meeting, they say, wow, you really remind us of why we're here, you know, because you're like the heart, mm -hmm. you know, or you're the one who keeps the heart beating uh, or visible, so. I sort of have this home at Encores, I guess. I just, oh, I just cool. realized I've had, I've had <laughs> home for 28 productions that I, the things I've adapted. 28. 28. 28. Anyone Can Whistle starts next week. Wait, and cool. that will be 28. And so that's been like, you know, the graduate, graduate school yeah. of playwriting because yeah. there's no substitute for getting your hands inside of someone else's work and being respectful mm -hmm. but doing, mm -hmm. the, doing mm -hmm. what's necessary to put it up at Encores. Mm -hmm. And so... That has, that has been one of the most joyful things that's ever happened to me. And, and every show is different. Mm -hmm. um, you have basically six days of rehearsal, so right. it's the way theater is supposed to be. It's quick and dirty. <laughs> <laughs> it's the way Shakespeare did it, so it's right. good, enough for, good enough for me. And so that has been an amazing thing uh, to have lived through 28. And um, You've all had scripts published. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a moment when you look at something, your work, and you think, okay, that's it for all time. Well, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh, or is you it? Laugh? I'm so you know, I, I'm not really a detailed person, and, uh, and I'm uh, <laughs> and I, I'm a terrible proofreader. And so, um, uh, when the first play of mine to be published was Vampire Lesbians of Sodom, and I, I guess I proofread it in my own fashion, mm -hmm. and then I went to see. A uh, we, a bunch of us went to see a community theater production in Connecticut. We thought mm. it would be sort of campy to go see it. <laughs> and, uh, and I knew that I'd, there were some typos in the script. <laughs> and so, so, so I'm watching this thing, and suddenly this, you know, this girl starts saying, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, what, what the hell is she saying? Like, oh, my God, she's, she's saying the typo. <laughs> and then at that point, I, I, I knew, then I, re I knew, oh, my God, she's going to go to page 28. Oh, my God, they're going to go to page 48. <laughs> and they kept just wow. saying these, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and so afterwards, you know, we you know, went back saying, oh, you're all marvelous. It was right. a wonderful yeah. show, wonderful show. And, and, and I said, you know, I just have to tell you that that's not a real word you're saying. She said, we all wondered. We just thought you were kind of avant-garde. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so maybe a, not forever and ever. I yeah, a, you have to be careful. And so now I try, but it's very difficult. I had a version of forever and ever in a different way. You know how um, sometimes you see a, a, an edition of your play, mm -hmm. um, which I haven't seen before. I was at the drama bookstore, and they had, there was a book of short plays, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I saw that I'd been included, and they put one of mine in. I, my agent must have cleared it. But in any case, I always look to see what biography they use, you know, <laughs> what out-of-date biography. And so I, I, I ignored the play, and I went to the back, and, and this is what I read. David Ives, 1917 to 1984, <laughs> was the head of WGBH radio, television in Boston. He died of a heart attack after having been beloved for many years in the city of Beans or something. I don't know, but it was so weird wow. reading my wow. obit in the back of wow. one of my books. So wow. that's forever and ever. Wow. Yeah. wow. Isn't that that's really cool. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's horrible. Well, yeah. Horrible. Yeah, horrible. Yeah, wonderful. Horrible. Wonderful. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. Horrible. He's got a whole new life. Yeah. 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 Right. You know, David, I knew him. I truly right. did. Oh, yeah. Truly yeah. did. Wow. Yeah. So that's wow. completely bizarre that, that you're dead. I actually, the I actually other remember David opening Ives. the Times. Well, there's other David Ives? The late David Ives was the I opened the Times one day, and there was this headline, David Ives dead at 84. <laughs> yeah. you know? wow. I, I didn't tell That's my wife. Yeah. 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 I kept it from her that day. That day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. At least alive. Though, <laughs> no. Every day is a more. gift. Yes. Every day is a gift. <laughs> <laughs> the Theater Development Fund published a book no. recently about the American playwright and and um, the problems and the concerns. So I just wanted to ask you if you all feel that, that that there have been changes in the American theater since you started writing and and then if, if there have to be changes for the future, you know, what, what are they and how, how much time help? do we have left? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, you know, right. uh, this, you know, this is the elephant in the room. Right. <laughs> I mean, let's well, face I figure we've had, but, we've had fun so uh, far. Let's get the elephant. Yeah, yeah. but uh, uh, you're referring to Outrageous Fortune, right. the life and times of the American, new American play by Todd London and et al. And uh, it's a remarkable uh, manifesto. I don't know if you guys have read it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I've, oh, yes, I've read it. Yeah. Uh, but I could only read 10 pages at a time because I have to go off and weep. No, well, exactly, exactly. I, I did read it. It's, it's very, very well put together. You know, I don't know how scientific it is, but it is anecdotal and very powerful in its anecdotal. I, I don't really know anything. Well, I'm here, so dumb. It's I don't statistics. Really know it's statistics. They do these, these extraordinary surveys of how much playwrights earn, what plays right. theaters do, how mm -hmm. many plays by women, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and so they amalgamate, they uh, uh, um, gathered all this information over, I don't know, how many years, was and they put it together, and it's period. deeply depressing. Deeply well, and depressing. One, one thing that they deal with is, is whether the theaters across the country have become less generous to new playwrights, less uh, mm -hmm. bold, and, and uh, they seem to be more conservative because they want to appeal to their audience. Mm -hmm. Is that, do you have experience that would say that that's maybe the case or not? Well, y y you know, I, I, and this is, I don't mean to, to um, uh, stand on a soapbox or anything, but one, one of the things that I think that uh, we, all, we theater people need to do is, I, I, I feel this tendency toward demonizing artistic directors. And I think that really what, that, what the problem is, is that everybody is, is, is really scrambling for money. Mm -hmm. And everybody is terrified, and everybody's trying to make their quarterly payments. And there's a tremendous amount of fear. But I think that what I'm a little leery of is that um, it's not, the artistic directors are just as grief-stricken and terrified as everybody else. I don't think that they're, you know, foolish people or venal people. I think they're really trying to keep their theaters afloat, because I think there's, there's, there, there are yeah. real, there are real casualties. And uh, you know, I have friends who run theaters, and well, how many characters in that play that you just recommended? Well, six. We can't do it. We can't do it. Mm -hmm. And you know, so there's a lot of character counting going on, and how many sets? And uh, can we afford to do this? What if we did it as a co-production? I mean, all of these things are raised in Todd's book that are really, I think, beginning a larger national conversation, which I, I think is a terrific idea. I don't know what we're going to do about right. it except talk about it now, but at least we're talking about it now and acknowledging that it's a national problem and that we are all in it together. We who love theater and have devoted our lives to it are in this together. You have all had commissions by, by theaters, um, mm -hmm. and I'm fascinated by how that works and, and also I mean, how it would work out in, in, in the country. 
when a theater commissions you, what do they say? A play to be decided? Yeah. A play with three characters in one set? No. I mean, no. Or does no, it vary? No. They're open commissions, yeah. Yeah. generally yeah. open yeah. commissions. Yeah. Uh, write, something. Uh, write something for us. Uh, in write some instances, something. it took me four or five <laughs> years to write something, and they were mm -hmm. completely cool with that. Did you describe it to them at all no, in advance? No, no, no. Not at all, just, just no. they no. want you to write a play, no. and then you just... No, the only play that had any kind of specific uh, 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 caveat was when I wrote Shipwrecked in Entertainment. It began as a, a commission for South Coast Repertories Theater for Young Audiences, although it became a more sophisticated and bigger, more ambitious play than that, mm -hmm. and, and it was main staged. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was the only time that there were, was any, any kind of constraint at all. So no full frontal nudity? No, <laughs> there was none of that. <laughs> not, actually, not on the children's <laughs> I actually don't accept those commissions. I, uh, um, I, I you mean any accepted no, I don't accept open commissions where they say we'll give you twenty-five thousand dollars to write something for us in the next five years. I, um, I find that paralyzing actually, and I, I did it. Or, or I'm however just much. Uh, twenty-five thousand. I'll give you five or however much. I don't know what the going rate on plays <laughs> you is could these just days. Have them call me. Two thousand. Okay. No, I, I don't know. What <laughs> that no, is. Sorry. Okay. If they if they come to me with a specific project, the the, the Shakespeare Theater of Washington just yeah. came to me last year and said, "There's a play by Corneille from 1643. Mm -hmm. It's a comedy, and would you like to would you like to adapt it?" And I said, "Send it to me." And so I read it, and mm -hmm. I thought. Yes, I will do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But for somebody to say, write me something, I get absolutely paralyzed. And I, so I only write, I feel I can only sit down and write mm -hmm. freely mm -hmm. um, when there's no money involved, no deal, yeah. nobody's yeah. expecting anything. And I just write what I want and I show it. And if it's good, it's it will be done. Yeah, it's but you, do you, you take commissions I, I, a lot? I, I yeah. used to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just like to be free. You know, I write something and then you, I show it to people and if they'd like to do it, then. Cool, and if they don't, that's all right. You know, yeah, I these I, days. I, I, um, well, La Jolla Playhouse um, commissioned me to write a play, mm -hmm. and I, sort of on the phone, uh, <laughs> sort of described one sort of play I would write for them, and then we got the, made the arrangements, and then I sat down, but I don't want to write that play at all. And then I thought of another idea, and then I called them, oh, it changes this play, then that one didn't work out very well. Yeah. <laughs> called them back, oh, it's this play, because I get a different idea every day, you know. So if I act the end, I think I took about three of the ideas, put them all together, and, and had one big flop. <laughs> How are you called upon to help the next generation? What kind of advice do you give? Mm. Uh, well, I, I teach playwriting at, to, to Yale undergraduate. Uh, graduates, I've been doing it about 20 years, and the first question I have at the, f at the first meeting is, why are you here? <laughs> why do you want to be a playwright? What is it? And we talk about it, the, the thrill of theater and you know, how they awaken to it at a certain age, and it's you know, versions of the play that changed my life. And it's really, um, it, what I find very encouraging is how much, um, how much interest there is on the part of of some young people in making theater. That it, it is not as arcane and as antiquated as one might think, but that there is a real sense of Mickey and Judy putting on a show, particularly among Yale undergraduates who, I, I don't know when they sleep, I think they're all on amphetamines because I don't know when they sleep. Because they're constantly doing multiple shows. They're mm -hmm. writing something, they're directing a fringe show, you know, it's all this stuff mm -hmm. going on. They're remarkable young people. I. I I admire them and I, I love them. They're, they're terrific. They really make you feel this tremendous sense of hope uh, for, uh, for this art mm -hmm. that we, you know, we consider so endangered. But they are uh, they're so bright and, and kind and committed and helpful to each other. It's, they're, they're just terrific. And I've had a bumper crop the last couple of years. I've, I've, I've seen some really terrific talent emerge out of, uh, out of the undergraduate class. I actually don't feel that theater is endangered or ever will be. I mean, I think, I think sort of what you feel about writers, that the oak will out, and theater always will. It's a, it's a, it is a natural instinct, especially among the young, mm -hmm. you know, that urge to portray other people and put yourself in front of people and gather together to create something, yeah. I think will always happen. The, I think the, the theater will, will always be here in some way. What the, the problem is, is the same problem, it's money. and, and but that's a superficial problem, and I, th I always take great inspiration from the number of plays that get put on and get written, and the number of kids I run into who want to write plays, and 
And so I'm, I'm very sanguine about theater as an art form. I just think it's a natural, it's as natural as conversation, which is what it is, you know. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's made of air, which is our souls, you know. And so it will always out. And um, so in spite of all of the, the dire statistics about money and playwrights making a living, you know, if you have a play to write, you will write it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter yeah. why. Or, you know. yeah, I totally agree. I, I, you know, it's, you know, I started doing these plays in the East Village in this kind of crazy milieu, and and people say, oh, that doesn't exist anymore, and all this. But I, I yeah, I, I think there's always going to be young people who want, need to express themselves, and and there's and it's the need, the human need to tell stories and mm -hmm. and to listen to stories and uh, and see themselves and or see a fantasy world or or all these things. And uh, so yeah, I think there will always be young people who who somehow will make it happen mm -hmm. and will do the play somewhere. All four of you have had plays on Broadway, and uh, I thought sort of to, to, to wrap this up, um, am I right in saying that it's a nice place to visit, but you don't necessarily <laughs> have to live there? Uh, well, you know, it's a f I never aspired to Broadway. It just sort of happened to me. It's a very s different experience. Uh, the, my first time out, was it was a commercial Broadway production. It was a total debacle. It put me into a, a clinical depression. You got, you got another hour? Right. And, uh, and it, it was a really uh, uh, terrifying experience. Uh, it, my, my subsequent forays uh, have been under the auspices of Manhattan Theater Club, which is still a, a not-for-profit theater on a Broadway stage. So you have the benefits of, of the beautiful stage at the Friedman Theater, which is one of the best playhouses in New York. It's just it's exquisite. And, um, and you have a larger audience. More people tune in. It's, it's really... But not just more. I mean, I think numbers are one thing, but when we did Top Dog Underdog on Broadway, what I found was that there were people, a lot of young people, mm -hmm. who had never been to a play before, ever. Mm -hmm. Sitting next to folks who had been, who'd seen Tennessee Williams on Broadway. Yes. Um, and that, to me, was a great joy. I felt yeah. like we were really providing a great service for those folks and for the art form and for culture, you know. So then that's what I think Broadway's great for. You got, you get numbers and you also get different kinds of people with the possibility of that, which mm -hmm. is important. I think on that note, I want to thank you all for being here. This has been wonderful. Thanks for joining us. These programs are brought to you from the Graduate Center of the City University of New York in partnership with our friends at CUNY TV. On behalf of the American Theatre Wing, I'm Ted Chapin, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Working in the Theatre. I'm Ted Chapin, chairman of the American Theatre Wing. The Wing has played a vital role in New York's theatrical life for more than 60 years. Best known for creating the Tony Awards, we stand for excellence, but we also support education in the theatre, and our work reaches beyond Broadway in New York. The Working in the Theatre television programs, which are supported by the Annenberg Foundation and the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, are unequaled forums for discussions with today's most creative artists. Downstage Center's in-depth radio interviews were created in conjunction with XM Satellite Radio and can be heard on our website. Our annual theater company grants support New York not-for-profits and since they began have distributed nearly three million dollars. We are also pleased to be the home of the Jonathan Larson grants, which support emerging composers and lyricists. For people who are starting their careers, we have a two-week boot camp for aspiring actors from colleges across the country called Springboard NYC. And our theater intern group provides a forum for young people who are starting their careers to build a professional network. All of the American Theater Wing's educational and media programs are available for free on demand from our website, americantheaterwing.org. Thanks for your interest in the Wing, and thanks for watching.